Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I'll be joined on the line later today by John Noonan. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I want to give you a little recap of the week that was, maybe just wrap a little bit, because man, crazy times, my friend, right? I think we're going on week three, maybe week four of being locked down. <laughs> it's one of those times where like things are just kind of bleeding together at this point, but it's been very strange not going into the gym on a regular basis. I mean, I still get in there a couple times a week, mostly to move my own body or to let my kids move theirs. But yeah, it's weird not being in the gym every day. It's weird not having the client interactions. So strange times, but I feel like hopefully we're kind of on the back end of this or we're approaching the peak so that ultimately things will start tailing it off and sooner or later we will get back into a more normal routine. So in the interim, we are basically working on a new routine. And this is something we talked about with our kiddos. We have like a a team meeting or a family meeting every Sunday at the dinner table. And last night we talked about, okay, like this is what it is. They actually got told last week that they're not going back to school. Like originally we thought it was May 1st and now that got kiboshed. So we've got no school. So essentially it's like four months until they go back to school in August. So what we had to talk about was, look, we need some sort of routine. We need some sort of structure. Even if you guys don't have school, you're going to have e-learning. Me and mom need some semblance of structure to our day. And ultimately, look, like kids need structure too. I'm not going to sit here and give you my philosophy on parenting. But if you want it sometime, I'd give it to you. (laughs) But, you know, kids need structure as much as we do. And they thrive in structure as well. So we basically set up some new routines yesterday. And we said, look, you know, we can't stay in our pajamas all day. We got to get up. We're going to take the work week just like it is a regular week. Jess and I are going to split up time. So she's got like three or four hours in the morning. I have three or four hours in the afternoon so that we can kind of divide and conquer, make sure the kids are getting, you know, what they need physically, spiritually, emotionally, nutritionally, (laughs) if that's a thing, because they like to eat. And, and we get our stuff taken care of too. But what's been fun is we've kind of cultivated this, this almost new routine, right? So obviously we've got the puppy. So the, the dogs in heaven because we're here all the time. He gets to play and interact with us. We've been doing a ton of puzzles. I don't think that's really a routine, but it's something that we've been enjoying doing together as a family. But I think one of the coolest things about this experience so far is that it's allowed us to do some things with the kiddos that we maybe wouldn't necessarily have as much time for. For instance, Kendall is absolutely obsessed with cooking right now. So like last night, she found this recipe that she wanted to make. So her and I made dinner and we did it together. And it was so much fun. Uh, Now, granted, it tasted delicious because you can't go wrong when it involves bacon and pancakes. But I mean, it was such a blast. And so today we were walking Finn this morning and she was like, I want to I want to cook again. So she helped me with food prep today. So we made these like pot of gold scrambles is what they're called. Basically, if you've ever been to Starbucks, that's like the little sous vide egg bites. I mean, we made those ourselves and they are amazing. They, I think they taste better. You know exactly what's in them. So it's been fun. And if you're struggling a little bit, try and look at the bright side. I know that sounds cliche, but like try and think about, okay, what is this time giving you that you maybe haven't had time to do in the past? What is it affording you to do that you maybe wouldn't have been as interested in or you wouldn't have had the time to do in the past? So it's been really valuable for me and I've got more thoughts as to what this quarantine is teaching us. Um, I may expound upon those at a later point in time, but I think ultimately this is teaching us a lot of lessons about ourselves, about our lifestyles. And, you know, again, I don't want to dive into that too much today, but if you're interested, I'll definitely talk more about it in the future. Uh, Some other things that this has allowed us to do. Number one, it's allowed Bill and I to kind of get on the same page. We're about to reopen iFastU. It's going to be different than how it was in the past. So if you join back up, you're not only gonna have access to all of the old materials, but you're gonna have access to uh, bi-weekly Q and A's. So Bill and I are each gonna do a Q and A each month. He and I are both gonna create a piece of content each month. And it's gonna be really cool because you know people want more Mike and Bill, so you're gonna get more Mike and Bill. So that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, If you wanna check it out, robertsontrainingsystems.com forward slash IFAST. Dash University. That's the placeholder for right now, just if you're interested in getting on the list to know. Otherwise, I'm sure I'm going to be talking about it both here and on my newsletter. Other things that I'm excited about, I'm going to start shooting some long form videos. So been doing pretty good 
with my video per day. I don't think I've missed a day in four weeks, four or five weeks now. So I'm doing really well there. I'm excited about that. But it's also got me craving doing some longer form stuff because I've got some questions and some things that people want me to talk about that I can't just put into like a two minute soundbite. It's not an exercise demo. It's not a technique cue. It's a little bit longer format stuff. So I'm excited. I'm gonna get my guy Paul to come up. We're gonna shoot some things. So be on the lookout for that. Um, it may be end of April, mid-May before I can actually do it. Again, it's kind of a logistical thing right now, but I'm excited to work on that with him. And then one thing I wanted to mention here, if you guys did not check it out, this whole coaches versus COVID webinar series, dude, so I did this free webinar last Friday and they had, I mean, they had a great lineup of coaches. I don't even remember who all was there, but like Ron McKeefrey was there, Cam Joss was there. I think Bob Alejo was on there. Like it was like an amazing, amazing setup. Now, when they asked me to do it, I was like, oh yeah, sure, I'll do it. And I fully expected oh, 50 maybe a hundred coaches would be on there. I was absolutely shocked. So it's Friday night, eight o'clock. Again, I have to like freshen up my face and, you know, comb the beard, comb my hair. Jess was like, you need to like freshen up a little bit. Damn, I'm glad I did. Because when I logged on to present at eight o'clock on Friday night, there were 1,487 coaches logged on. So pretty freaking cool. I don't know what the final numbers were, but I know as of Friday night, when I spoke, we were closing in on 50K in donations. And again, sometimes that feels like a drop in the bucket when you're talking about a pandemic like coronavirus. But still, to think that we had that much community and that much support, man, it almost gave me chills. I was like, this is one of the coolest things that I have done in my time as a physical preparation coach. So if you didn't check it out, if you didn't donate, I think you can go back and do that now. Um, if you just Google coaches versus COVID, you'll find all the information. I think they're going to replay the videos and all that good stuff. So anyway, that's where I'm at. Before I jump into the show, I just want to say I hope you're doing well. Obviously, we're all kind of struggling a little bit and there's highs and lows. I think most of us have probably hit that point now where we're just like kind of okay with it. It's like it is what it is and we got to get through it. I hope you're there. If there's anything I can do to help you or see or support you, anything at all, hit me up, social media, email, anything that I can do to help you out, I would love to do. So my friend, let's take a quick break and then we're gonna jump into this awesome, awesome new show with my guy, John Newton. This episode of the Physical Preparation Podcast is brought to you by Momentus. For many years, I simply disregarded the age old advice of getting liquid protein in either during or after workouts. Part of this was due to the fact that most had so much crap in them, I didn't wanna put them in my body and others might've been high quality, but tasted absolutely disgusting. However, if you're looking for a protein that's not only high quality, but also tastes amazing, you need to check out Momentus. I've been using Momentus for several months now, and I can tell you it's hands down the best tasting protein I've ever had. But it's not just me. I have numerous elite level athletes who are very picky with their protein powders, and every one of them raves about how great Momentus protein shakes taste. And while the taste is amazing, the best part about Momentus is that they're incredibly transparent with what goes into their product. You never have to worry about a tainted or dirty supplement, as all of their products are NSF and Informed Sports certified. If you'd like to try Momentus out for yourself, head over to livemomentus.com forward slash Robertson and use the code Robertson20 to save 20% off your first order. Or if you want to try before you buy, get a free three-pack sample sent to your house by using the Robertson sample code at checkout. Regardless of which option you choose, I guarantee once you try Momentous Protein Shakes, you'll never go back to anything else. John Noonan is an accredited UKSCA strength and conditioning coach with over 15 years of experience working with both elite sport and the public domain. To date, John has worked with numerous professional youth, senior, and international athletes from over 13 different sports with some of the highlights being Chelsea and Everton FC of the EPL, multiple rugby teams, and F2 racing. In this show, John and I talk about how he's had success across multiple sports, why understanding people is so critical, the role of mentorship in your evolution, and why we should always be striving to have a more multidisciplinary model. John was amazing to chat with, and I really think you're going to enjoy this episode. But enough for me, let's do this. Mm-hmm. 
John, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to chat with you. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, listen, Mike, thanks for having us on. I've been uh, an avid listener for on and off a few years, as I just mentioned to you off air. So it's great to be here. I guess in terms of my background, it's it's pretty multivaried. I guess I'm the gypsy of the sport world a little bit. I've done quite <laughs> a bit in a few different areas. And uh, to coin a term off, off one of my friends and colleagues, Nick Grantham, that I guess I'm a bit of a specialist generalist in a number of areas, but yep. I started in team sport predominantly uh, in football, rugby union, did some work in rugby league around that time, did some work in snowboard cross, uh, Olympic ski and snowboard with a freestyle group, some alpine ski, uh, a few individual sports on the hop and then uh, back into football before now, where I find myself as a private business owner, an entrepreneur yeah. at hand and consulting with athletes and teams and, and running a coach mentorship. That's awesome, man. Stressful times to be a business owner too, right? A little bit more stressful than usual anyway. Yeah, it, it, it really is. And I certainly is quite a, quite a new business owner. It's, it's just almost a scary place to be. But to be honest, I'm, I'm trying to think about thriving and not, and not surviving. You know, yes, I, need, I, like I, I need to fix my mindset in a place that is thinking ambitiously. And, and yeah, you know, cash flow right now is king, of course, but I want to position myself. And hopefully uh, I'm trying to reach out to a few colleagues as well so that as I'm sure you are, you know, we're, we're putting ourselves in a good spot. So when the market does rebound, we're yep. positioned pretty well for it. So I love it. Yeah, I'm learning quickly, but um, <laughs> it, it's challenging times. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So tell me, what originally led you to the world of physical preparation? How did you get started in all this? Uh, well, I mean, I guess, I guess like many guys my age, I, I dreamed of becoming uh, a football player failed miserably at some trials for, for Hull City Football Club, and um, <laughs> I went into college and, and then really enjoyed that scene of just competitive football locally, albeit amateur. I, w- I was never that great at school, if I'm honest. I, I didn't necessarily apply myself that well. Didn't have a great deal of focus, um, and it wasn't until the exams came around that I got my ass into gear and fortunately just scraped into university. And then I found sports science. Yeah. It was really through that experience that 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 a passion grew a real fever inside me grew for that. And, and I was already working in, in the fitness industry, you know, working with a range of, of Joe Public and a few local amateur athletes. But I knew that I, I really wanted my future to still be in sport. But And then at that time, I guess s and in the certainly, uh, I guess, the time when you were starting at that point, yeah. or, or you've been your work in 2007, I heard of you and you know, the likes of Mike Boyle, and, and they were, the, I guess, the pioneers that paved the way for some of the materials that I read, some of the things that I listened to, and and the methods that I, I use and develop, develop myself today. So it was very much through the sports science and then an internship. And, and I kind of got the bug from there, really. So you know, I love it's, it. it's been a really good ride so far. I love it. So so take us from that point to all these different stops that you had. Like, Can you kind of like connect those dots and help us understand your career path? Because I think a lot of young coaches assume or they think they have this vision, right, of who they are and where they're going. And then they realize like, the road is a lot less direct than most of us think. So I'd love to hear just a little bit about your career path along the way. Yeah, look, I, if, if I'm being really honest, I, I had very much uh, an idyllic plan ahead of me, which was I was going to be an intern, an assistant, a full-time, you know, full-time coach on the ground. Then I was going to head up a program and be a performance director. That was the idyllic right. pathway. I was going to work. I, ideally, England rugby was going to be the pinnacle for me. And I felt that one step or another, I was slowly making moves toward that. And then life got in the way a little yeah. bit. And it, I was saying to you before the call, we, we've got uh, a young family now, two girls under the age of two. Another one on the way as well. So we've got... A oh, man. It, um, yeah, <laughs> it's gluttony for punishment, isn't it? <laughs> but, um, it so I, I, I met my wife now in 2012. And at the time, I still wanted to work. And I do in full-time sport for the rest of my life. Yeah. But um, I think there came a point in my career where I recognized the cost on myself as a person and the family. And yes. and, and, and whilst the work's worth doing, definitely, uh, and I've been fortunate to work with some incredible people and some great teams and outfits, but I recognized, I think it was a conference I went to one year, and 90, 95% of the people in the room were men. And this was an annual conference in rugby. And I would say a large proportion, if not the majority, were all single, if not divorced yes and i thought okay this is the crowd i'm stepping into this mm-hmm. is the reality and this maybe is the cost and i had a long-term relationship that failed prior to uh, now my wife and, and i'm glad it did but it taught me a, a big lesson that you know you have to make some sacrifices if you if you want certain things your way 
And I talk to quite a few coaches on the mentorship right now that being in sport, it, it, it's not just a job, it's a vocation. And it's, it's, it's a commitment that not you, but the family have to make. And, yes. you know, when we talk about, when we talk about doing the hard yards, skin in the game, undoubtedly one person in that marriage or that relationship has to compromise. And, and, and I'm fortunate that my wife sees the passion and the value, hopefully, that I do and that it can support the family. And, yep. and really, my, her, her plan becomes my plan. But I definitely talk about it as being our plan. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it, it's very much, I think the reality is a compromise yeah. if you want to be in the long term. And it, I think if, if, you're, if you're the sort of person who can find a, a, a fit and a harmony with actually my compromises, I want to be single I want to be for the job and this is what who I am. Fantastic. And, and that's exactly what you should do. Yep. But um, I think if you, I don't know, for want of a better word, this might be terrible to say so, but if you want to strike more, strike more of a balance that I think you identify with as a person, then maybe you, you, you have some difficult decisions to make along the way. Yeah. Um, and again, that's where, that's where I've gone. And, and, and it almost looks a little bit of hopping on the CV, but <laughs> One thing that's always stood by me is to be incredibly ambitious and driven for, for achieving excellence. And I became quite picky, I would say, about five years into the career to want to align myself with groups and an organization that really embodied the, the level of, 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 of training or thinking or behaviors that I wanted to model because I, I consider myself an absolute professional. And therefore, how I conduct myself and, and the relationships that I hold for me, for, for, you know, I kind of need to feel like I'm <sighs> my identity is at peace with the work that I do. It is very important to me that I have to be in a place that that, that models that. Uh, and inherently, admittedly, I've struggled when when that hasn't been the case and and made some difficult decisions and been faced with some tough tough environments sometimes. But yeah, you know, I think great characters forged in adversity, and, and I think through that I've become a stronger person and a clinician and, and a better father and a husband as a yeah. result as well. So, but you know, p- providing everyone's on, on the same ship, on the same bus, I'm, I'm in. I love it. Yeah, I remember. I think it was Keir Wenham Flat when he was on my show said something along the lines of, "Every professional strength coach is either single or on their way to being single." <laughs> and and <laughs> yeah. I thought that just yeah. really resonated with me. And I'm yeah. like, you know, it's true. Um, it's why you know I've never uh, like you. You know, I have a strong desire. I would say to be around a professional environment and work in that environment because I think the stakes are the highest, which I, I, I like and I enjoy. But at the same time, I was unwilling to make some of the personal sacrifices necessary to do that. So mad respect to you, man. Yeah. No, you know, likewise, and it, it's, it's never a tough decision. But, you know, I, I still go to the conferences in, in the UK, for instance, and it's difficult not to to aspire to, you know, some of the keynote speakers that you see out there who are working yep. with the likes of NFL high-end athletes and, and that's certainly i think what you know if, if you follow you know anyone prominent in, in snc and you know, on twitter or instagram and that's that's what their identity is and many many people want to emulate that but not many people understand the cost of business yep. so. i love it so i'd love to start by talking a little bit about your overarching philosophy when it comes to training because one thing you have had over the years is great levels of success across multiple sports so let's start with a very simple question, although maybe not easy. What are your big rocks when it comes to training and coaching? What are some of the things that you think have allowed you to be successful across all those sports? It's a really tough one, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to start really broad. And I think for me, there has to be a number of overarching principles. And I, I, I try and lead with principles or methods because principles are few, but methods are many. And I think if you get your principles down, you can apply that system framework to any sport. And that's what I've tried to do. Yep. And and. It largely starts with people, I think, and understanding people. One of the best things I think you can do, and I, I read this in one of Sir Alex Ferguson's autobiographies, is to listen, lead, and learn. And that you have to be able to listen first before you learn about the, you know, the key uh, assets and people in that environment and, and how you maybe need to influence them. And then when you, when you have a really good handle on, let's say, the behaviors, the values, and the beliefs of people that form a culture, then you're in a position where you can probably you know, start to influence and advise and recommend and then steer that ship in a certain direction that you think you need as part of an SNC program or you know your role as a leader in, within a group. The second one is I think it's really important to identify the vision and the expectations of that environment or that group. Of course, more often than not, the, the expectation is to win and, and sometimes at all costs. But what we do 
in a training environment week to week, sometimes it's not always about winning come, come a Saturday. Sometimes it's about just getting a saturation of can we develop enough skills, consistency to be in the, to be at the party come the end of the season for, right. for a championship playoff, for instance. So, again, you, you need to identify that. And I think once you can determine that, then as a coach or as a leader in a group, you can then probably influence practice more effectively because you've got a working hypothesis for, for what, what your influence is right now and yep. then further on what the delay gratification of that impact is. And then the third thing is process. And you know, Commonly, we're always taught to analyse the sport and reverse engineer the process and, and figure out what it takes to win. And for me, that's, that's as critical as any sport, you know, whether, whether I'm a, a first-year in coach or a 15-year experienced coach as I am today. And I think once you identify the process, then you can apply more more of the common threads of performance enhancement and preventing injuries. And I would say that probably, and it's a little bit controversial, but in the last five years, as, a, as someone who's an SNC, a sports scientist, SNC coach, I've probably spent a little bit more time developing a skill set within physical therapy mm. uh, and applied and applied medicine because I think of the rounded importance that that we need to continue to have as SNC coaches that can adapt and apply a number of tools to get the job done in a number of environments. So, you know, I've gone from working with groups to now working on my own as an individual where you're traveling the world with, with different with different athletes and groups and you have to be able to get the job done and not take on things that are outside of your domain or your skill set, but at least have uh, a little bit more leverage to offer value to, to, to a group or a person if you have a breadth of skills and experiences to offer. Yeah, that's so powerful. And you know, I'm reminded of 2005, 2006, 2007, when Eric Cressy and I were writing a lot of articles for T Nation and we were kind of making names for ourselves. And a lot of people tried to almost like bash us and say that we were trying to be physical therapists. And what I always tried to relay to them is like, no, but I want to understand what their job is. And I want to be able to kind of bridge that gap between the two. And now these are the discussions here 10 years later we'll, we're still having about being on the same page. And it's why we have the high performance structure, because like you alluded to, like you have to understand the entire training spectrum mm. if you want to be able to have success. And like you said, if you want to work in a high performance environment, you need to have a, an understanding of all the various roles and what everybody in that chain is trying to do if you want the whole team to be successful. 100%. And, and, and I think that certainly in the UK, I mean, that's where my experience largely is. We were very comfortable with with the idea of improving performance and developing people for sport competition, but I think where where we tend to struggle inherently as as practitioners or, or multidisciplinary departments, and and I can say this from an experience in football, you know, we have this identity issue that between your physical preparation coaches and your 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 medical therapists or your physiotherapists, there is inherently this conflict. Yep, and it's a conflict of interest where in the physio world, their first thought is do no harm. Yep. So any delivery of any exercise of, of any intensity modality is do not have first. Whereas the preparation coach is going, I've considered the risk. I'm going after the reward. And this is how I will apply that yep. to fit the individual and the profile. And I, I think what I've tried to do is, is, is play less on either side of that spectrum and try and find the middle spot if there even is one. It's like right. a chasm. But, but yep, stand absolutely. right there. You know, ask, ask the key questions that inherently people are often quite uncomfortable with. But when we see things like, um, you know, movement pathology, chronic injuries, patella tendon issues, for, for one example, it's asking the key questions about why does that knee keep getting pissed off? They're squatting well. They're moving well in all, 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 all exercises that I want. They're clean yeah. on the bed. But why is it they break down constantly when we look at, look at running or we return them to running? Even if we've got the application of loading right, so we've avoided training spikes, you've prepared them well enough, all your diagnostics suggest that they're ready to go, but we haven't yet quite figured out what's happening on the pitch that's breaking them down the most. Yep. And I think once you go to that point, then you have a more profound impact on the department because if the individuals are willing and the egos are at the door and you're at the center of the table and then you can pick apart that puzzle and say, maybe we need to look at this differently or, or what specialists are doing in this area rather than looking at you know everything as as inflammation incision and injection i think the three eyes that might boil that stuck with me for years yeah you know he would mention it's not just about that if we keep having an athlete that breaks down in front of us and maybe it is the way that we're applying the snc program sometimes but have a willingness to peel that onion back and think a little bit deeper and look at look at the value of pain science and understand some of those models to help us figure out what is it we're missing as part of 
just get strong because yeah. sometimes that isn't always good enough, is it? Yeah, absolutely. So kind of along those same lines, what are some of the common threads that you see when you're working with athletes, regardless of the sport that they're competing in? So like, what are some of those key factors that you see in those athletes that have been successful across mm. sport? Well, I mean, you know, talking about, again, my experience from football to, to collision sport, to team, to um, Olympic winter sport, it, yeah, you know, the sport, the competition, the training is substantially different, but quite often there's a real commonality, I think, in the people and the behaviors that you, you tend to you tend to work with. Um, and I think probably in the last year to two years, so I currently do quite a bit of work in, in Formula Motor Racing, and it's really stretched me out of my comfort zone to, to you know, first and foremost, there's very little impact from a training perspective I can often have, particularly at the track with someone like that because the training's done in pre-season the season is so congested it's <laughs> largely about maintenance if not a little bit of peaking here and there and, and you're really faced with someone you know other than carrying a water bottle an umbrella uh, and making sure nutritionally they're good to go mentally there's, there's a huge bit of work to done in terms of making sure that they're in the right place to cope with uh, anxiety expectation pressure and make decisions at the right moment and so you find yourself having deeper conversations that may borderline on, on psychology and, and a meaningful strategy in that place but really you have to strip back okay it's not about the sport so much but but what is the mental model of the person that i've got in front of me what are some of the issues that they're facing often that, that either make them choke or, or mean that they can they can flourish in, at the right time and how do we get them to figure out and handle or, or, or make progress with using some tools that maybe you can give them or you can discuss to make them more successful more often. So really, you, you, you're probably talking about mindset and behaviors. Yep. What, what are the typical mindsets that you find in elite performers or, or people who don't become elite performers and why is that? And when they're under pressure, a fight and flight situation, how are they delivering on those mindset preferences by using behaviors to cope and flex and thrive? And you know, I'm, I'm spinning a few comments there from uh, Spotlight profile yep. um so i you know, the, i'll give him a shout out because he's, he's an excellent practitioner but chris gouda is um or gouda i don't know if i mispronounced that sorry chris <laughs> but he, he's a phenomenal sports psychologist who does some work with us uh, as an expert at hits of performance and we've got some phenomenal people as part of that program where we we deliver our services to the motorsport world um and it's really given me a framework and an ability to have these have these grand conversations but more often than not you're not opening Pandora's box. You're just kind of looking at it with your frame of reference and using a common sense approach to helping people understand performance yep. and, and their own weaknesses and inadequacies and find better ways to, to flourish at the right time. I love that. And I don't think most people understand how big of a deal mindset is. I think most people, if they're not around high level athletes, would assume that, oh, well, if they're in the NBA or they're in formula two or you know they're playing professional rugby like they've got to be just like this just exuding confidence right and they're yeah. just like a hundred percent spot on all the time when a lot of the athletes that i work with it's this constant battle of am i good enough am i going to get to that next level da, da, da. you know like there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes mentally that most people take for granted 100 mm. percent. and you know one of the great things about working with formula two guys is that yeah, you know they have probably have a year or two to to make some massive errors, um, yep. and, and these cars are really expensive pieces of kit. <laughs> Team and the amount of infrastructure and, and planning that goes behind a race weekend is is phenomenal, and and I think looking at this might digress slightly from what you just said, but no, you're fine. You, you you look top down on on the performance model and the behaviours of people within that system, and and the engineers are thinking very much about it's the car, you know, the engineering, the finance and the intel that goes into that car is is the most important thing on the weekend. That's where their mind's going. Yeah. The physical preparation guy's going, actually, it's the piece of meat that's driving your vehicle <laughs> the most important thing. Right. Um, so the cars, you're, you're all of a kind of a similar playing field until you get to F1, of course. But the individuals behind that, that, that wheel are phenomenally important. And yet we overlook the importance of getting down to what really matters and influencing the people behind the wheel rather than just looking at you know, the mechanics of the situation and thinking it's all about the car, the intel, uh, and the software that you're using. Much like, you know, in, I'm sure in football and other team sports, we, we, we play drives the importance of, of having efficient monitoring systems, right. GPS systems, 
but it doesn't define the success of the individuals that are kicking the ball around at a weekend. Yeah, I love that. So on the flip side of that, what are some of the biggest differences you've seen across sports? And how do you go about addressing or handling those as a coach? Yeah, it's, it's a really quite tough one. I mean, the, the biggest differences I've seen in team sport collision and, and Olympic sport and the, and the motor racing, of course, is, is the mode of the competition, you know, the, the nature and how they compete, the activities behind the competition. Apart from that, I think the similarities or, or the differences, should I say, is kind of stop there. Yeah. And again, I think as a coach, again, who, who has to, has to perform and, and provide a, a meaningful service at any one of those levels or environments, again, comes back to how, how effective that you are kind of being a chameleon and then, and then adapting and changing your model almost on the fly. Yep. Again, leading, leading with kind of a people first approach and, and getting down to the basics of what do these people need out of me right in front of me? What type of behaviors and individuals do I have to influence? What, what are, what are the behaviors and values of the people around those who are who are key performers that that are often there as well? Yep. So, for instance, well, actually, do you know what? So, I, when I did a bit of work in in snow sport, I, I'd worked in team sport for quite a number of years, and I and I would come to the party, come to the work, and just expect people to lace the boots on and and be getting after it, hungry to compete, and you'd be holding them back very often, especially in rugby. Right. So, so you know, lots of alpha males, lots of testosterone kicking around, all natural. <laughs> And and they're they're hungry to comp- to compete. And um, in in freestyle snow sport, whilst as soon as they got the boots on, they were hungry to go. If you got them in the weight room, a man probably talking, you know, five ten years ago. Now I think it has moved forward in terms of the characters, how they accept and value S and C. Yep. But there and then at that point, there wasn't a great deal of S and C. Certainly from a, a programming point of view, from a, a governing body point of view, being delivered down into the cold face practice and. These guys would just get really good at their skills because it was from years of, of growing up on the skate park, messing around with their mates, and, and just becoming really efficient at the task by just by default, but not by design. Yeah. And so as soon as an S and C coach he wants to put in things like, you know, design purpose programs, uh, periodization and, and, and meaningful progressive loading, right. it doesn't live very well in that world. So I was <laughs> on a really fast learning curve. And I had a bit of a tip off coming into the environment just to sort of take a back seat and, and watch as things unfolded. But I had a, a young male who I still work with today, Jamie Nichols, and he's probably been our best lifestyle male for a number of years. We've, we've had a few of them, but he was a really tricky, tricky character because he'd injured his knee, he stretched his right ACL, and we were in a position where about three to four months out of him going to Olympic Games in 2018, he had to learn a triple, so spinning, you know, coming off a large kicker, 50 meters in the air, rotating about your axis three times whilst also inverting around your axis three times. Oh my gosh. Phenomenal skill set. And we had to get to a point where you could be back on snow within 12 weeks, learn that trick specifically to be in the party to then maybe get a medal or, yeah. or at least a place on the podium. And um, the, the starting conversations were so difficult because I, I came in with this, I guess, ignorance and went, so mate, this is what I reckon we do from a strength training point of view. I need to profile you. We're going to do this, this, this. And he was like, never really strength trained and I don't like it so immediately <laughs> you're kind of going oh right I need to get some familiarity here and then I yes. just kind of went back door and went okay so what do you like to do where can we start and, and you know, the gym sessions for anyone looking on will go mate that's not S&C you're just you're just cocking around but it was play initially and then every single session became a little bit I wouldn't say formal but a bit more meaningful for, from an S&C lens to say right. oh, I can see why you would do that now and I can see why that would have a place on you know, improving tissue quality or strength or and it was very much a guided discovery yeah he he was very much driving the bus that was evident and i was never gonna drive that bus for him but it was all about laying down the road and then kind of navigating on that gps and i think once once i kind of got out of my own way a little bit and made sure that he was driving the bus we had far more impact but that was just one example from you know working with team sports where performance and training is a given yeah, it's synonymous, synonymous, and they they know that training equals better performance more often than not. Whereas in the in the, in the free sport world, it, it wasn't necessarily the case as far as where I found it. So yeah, yeah. it's a good, really good learning curve. No, I love that, and I love the idea of you said two things there that really stood out. Number one, letting the athlete drive the bus. I think that's such a powerful tool and concept, and especially as a young coach, we like want to put our mark on everything, put our stamp on it, and say, oh yeah, I did this, or I helped this athlete do that, versus putting the ego aside and letting the athlete kind of steer the ship a little bit. 
But then the other thing that you said too, is kind of using the backdoor approach. And I've used that numerous times. I haven't used that terminology, but I love it. Of, you know, some people just aren't into the weight room as much as we are. And so sometimes, especially again, when we're younger as coaches, we're like, oh, how can you not be into the weight room? Like, we gravitated there because we didn't make it (laughs) in professional sport. So we just can't fathom somebody not enjoying it as much as we do. So I think those are two really important points, especially for young coaches that are listening. Maybe take that approach. Let them drive the bus a little bit. If they're not feeling it, try and kind of backdoor it a little bit to try and get them on board with you as a coach, first and foremost. Yeah, 100% agree. So kind of shifting gears here, something that I know you're really passionate about now is mentoring young coaches. So I'm really intrigued. Like, how did you get started doing that? Do you know what? It it was never a plan, but um, as a byproduct of being a head of S&C in in a few different environments, naturally you're you're in charge of a group and a team. And I think when I was developing as a young coach, like sub five years, I was, I was hungry for, for, for direction. Yep. Um, I, I, I'd never, never wanted to sit and pick up books and, and, until now, but I, I was very much learning through doing, and I was hungry to see best practice delivered in front of me and almost emulate a lot of those things and kind of steal from different areas, amalgamate it into mine and then, and then apply it based on what I saw in front of me. And for the most part that can work, but you know, I, I went from working in, in the Premier League very early in my career. I had a really great couple of mentors there, one in sports science nutrition, another one in S and C. And they were phenomenal, particularly in football. But as soon as I went into rugby, again I was looking for for that best example, that best model. Uh, and I didn't find it. I was really disappointed in, in what I found. And I'd, I'd kind of I'd cherry picked a, a role, if you like, in, in a club, which which I won't mention now. And and the head at the time, the head of the first team, I was a bit disappointed in what I saw, to be honest. Mm. And that was a guy who'd been there for twenty years. And, yeah. and, and been international coach and lots of success uh, and it kind of at that point really confirmed a lot of the earlier uh, online information that i'd grabbed from the likes of my Boyle, yourself very cressy <laughs> you mentioned as well yeah and a few of the leaders where i thought well that i know that's best practice there i'm just not seeing that emulated over here right. and so it became a real uh, I, I guess urge of mine throughout my career to make sure that i was always achieving and trying to model best practice but when people ask me certain questions make sure that i was i was living up to my own standards and so um, a long way of saying that when I left my recent role at Everton Football Club, a couple of guys that had worked underneath me or, or, or in different groups, but within that setting, they reached out and said, would you would you be up for you know formally mentoring me? And so I kind of, by default, created a process around it. <laughs> they really enjoyed it. I was really enjoying that because it was keeping me honest and, and me forward thinking in my practice. And then I, I decided to kind of, uh, again, within the entrepreneur aspect of things, open it up and... Um, it's on the website now and I'm actively running it. And if I'm honest, I'm, I'm probably still f- figuring out where this really goes in the future, but I've got a, a small group at the minute of around, I think about 13 coaches. And I think one of the values of it that maybe differs to some of the mentorships out there is that because it is so small, I can really get quite personable yeah. and want to work. And, and the place where we start is really to identify and figure out what success looks like for you as an individual in let's say 12 months time from now, because you know what you and I are doing today has a bearing very much on the future, but we're doing these things and we think in this way because we know it has a bigger impact later down the line. Yep. And so I try to look to reverse engineer the process and then co-create a framework that puts the building blocks in place to get that, holding us both accountable to the material, the knowledge, the skills that we need to create around it. And then again, guided discovery, walk them through that process, but, but make sure that they're driving the bus, so that they've got the skills that they can apply in their environment. And I'm not just saying, use this template, off you go. Mm. So yeah, it, it's been a really humbling but great experience so far. That's great, man. It kind of killed my next question because I was going to ask, you know, like how do you how do you kind of onboard a new coach or how do you get somebody started? Is there like an evaluation process where you kind of sit down one to one? I mean, I'm just fascinated by this because this is something that I do as well, mm-hmm. and I get a lot of joy from it because I've taught interns for years. But you know, interns now there's a much bigger gap when you've been doing this 15 to 20 years and you get an intern versus a coach that's maybe been doing this five, 10 years and they're just looking to continue to level up. So how do you kind of figure out where they're at? You do an ease analysis of sorts and, and and again, working remotely because all all of these relationships are remotely for me. There's there's very few that are in person because of where I live. Uh, I think you have to, you assess again, 
a, a little bit like an athlete. You you know you would profile yeah. or you would run through certain tests. So we'll have some pretty deep conversations on where they're where they're at from a mindset and behavior point of view. So kind of using some of my experiences in that spotlight profile, mm-hmm. um, and then figuring out. Or, or kind of walking back through some failings or some experiences that hadn't gone so well and then apply their mindset and behaviors to maybe that's what we could do differently. Let's think about this going forwards, but making sure that as a person, they're growing as part of the process and not just becoming a coach. You can, you can talk sets and reps, for instance. Right. And then we want to talk about, you know, okay, so what is the ideal goal for you in the future? And if that is to get a goal, uh, sorry, a role within a full-time club or you want to be, a certain position within 10 years from now well listen i can tell you these are some of the requisite qualities that you're going to need to have do you have these at the moment and it's a simple you know identify what's missing plug in the gaps with what what will come from information um you know some of it's very much knowledge based that i'll deliver yeah. and other bits are a little bit more kind of check and challenge and have regular conversations about what's your thoughts on that can i challenge you to think this way Maybe if we be a little bit more creative about this process, what do you think about that? So some of it's apply and then review afterwards, but a lot of it, we'll do, we'll do an easy analysis on what's missing based on where they want to go and then fill those gaps in as we go a little bit more. And that's kind of just through a regular month call process. And it's not perfect. And I guess I do at the moment at least adapt some aspects of, of this process as we move forward. Yep. Um, but it's, it's given me a lot of impetus to think about how I would try and at least influence a bigger a bigger group of, of S&C coaches or therapists in the future. I think there's a lot of mileage in it because you and I, I'm sure over the years, have gone to many conferences, workshops, webinars, online learning platforms, and they're fantastic. But more often than not, you you find yourself learning their module approach, whatever yes. that is. You, you fit their system in a way, yep. although it's well intended to help you. It, it rarely gets down to the bare bones of what you need. Yep. And what's specific to, to your background and, and your interests and your values and beliefs and, and challenging that. And I think that's that's where the real richness of this one-to-one relationship can go. Yeah. And that's something that I really enjoy about the mentorship process as a whole is, number one, you learn more about them as a human. And you start to figure out like why they program the way that they do, why their thought process is the way that it is. Um, but I think what's fun as well is kind of that evolution of the process as well. And as you work with somebody longer and longer, just the relationship changes in the sense that when you're starting with somebody, you know, they're looking to you for answers or insights. And as you maybe give them some of those, and you start to help them understand things better over time. Now it's not so much this, I'm going to give you the answer. It's I'm going to ask you more questions until you kind of figure out what the answer is for you. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. I think kind of that, back and forth process is really valuable as you continue to work with a mentee or a young coach. I couldn't agree more. I think the evolution that you probably just described better than I ever could actually, but definitely the conversations and I think the things that you're getting to work on with someone who's been on maybe sub three, four, five months is very, very different to someone who is a 12 months plus because yeah. they, they have the methods, right? They have the tools, they have the practices to be, they're probably in an environment somewhere. Yeah, but you're just helping them navigate some obstacles that they come up against, and invariably you're coming back to, and you talked about before, but mindset, um, and, and what choices we're making and why. And what's, I think that's quite a humbling question for a lot of people is, what is it you want to achieve? And then you, when you get down to, okay, so what does your working week look like? What what kind of actions are you taking based on the things that you say you want to achieve? Right. And quite often you'll find that these two things are in massive conflict with each other. <laughs> yes. Like the behaviours and and, and 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 actions are nowhere near aligned to the purpose. So sometimes it's kind of quite relieving for some people to sort of go, oh, crap, right? That's why I wasn't seeing the progress I really want. And this is why I'm becoming frustrated. Yes. But, you know, but I've been there. I've been yeah. there. And it's generally speaking, the kind of people that do reach out and want to work on these sort of things are willing to, again, strip back, open the door a little bit more and be, be I guess, up for finding, for finding out other ways and means of doing things. And it isn't always one way to achieve it because there isn't. You know, yeah. A hundred ways to skin a cat, as we both know. Yeah. No, I love it, man. Okay. Big question time. If you could alter the space-time continuum and give young John Noonan one piece of advice about training and or life, what would it be? Uh, Wow. I would say don't be in a hurry. Mm. Don't be in a hurry. I would say that as, again, as a, a very young, ambitious coach, uh, working in the Premier League quite early, you you very easy, very quickly, should I say, find yourself thinking about, right, next opportunity, next job. 
um, particularly if you've had a bit of success very early, you, you know, yep. you probably overlook some of the key things that you need to get right as a coach and as a person before you've really earned your straps to be in those sort of roles. And I'm under no illusion, you know, I, I had a really good network. They valued me. I, I, I looked after my network and, and it, it gave me certain, certain opportunities quite, quite early on in my career. And then from that point onwards, I was, because I was so ambitious to go the next step, go from an academy to a first team and as such, you, I think you overlook the importance of just sort of, you know, holding yourself on on what you think you can do and what level you think you're at. You know, not getting ahead of yourself quite simply, and just yeah. and just kind of soaking up the years and the mileage that sometimes you've just got to pick up. You know, physios talk about patient mileage. My my mom's a nurse, and the same thing. The mileage has a massive impact on thinking um, and, and where you take where you or, or where you make certain decisions with how your your products and your your service develops. So don't be in a rush and don't be in a hurry and, and almost be ignorant to the fact that you, it's important to get mileage in the tank and it will only stand you in really good stead in the future. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with that. I tell every coach that comes in my gym, whether they're an intern, somebody that's observing, you can't, you can't cheat the reps, right? Like you can't nice. cheat experience. Yeah. You can pick up a lot of knowledge. I mean, hell, there's so much information on the internet. Now you could learn all of the things, but it doesn't replace that experience that you get in the gym, working with clients, working with athletes on a regular basis. There's just no way to fast track that. It's just, you got to put in the time. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. My friend, last but not least, we've got our lightning round. So for fairly short questions, your answer can be as long or short as you'd like. All right. Okay. All right. Number one, I'm sure this will be tough. What's your career highlight so far as a coach? I would say working with a an unbelievably forward thinking and humble medical medical group so we had a, an snc department were absolutely on the same page with the medical group forward thinking willing to challenge open minded um, and proactive in, in in what we did and that was when i was working working in rugby league with a group yeah they were phenomenal that's awesome man number 2 you've worked across a multitude of sports and i'm sure you have fond memories of all of them but is there one experience or position that really stands out to you? Well, the the, the freestyle ski snowboard was pretty cool. Going to some amazing places, you know, stood on yeah. the top of a kicker, helping out with the coaches a little bit, filming guys as they're coming over with these tricks. You know, you're kind of <laughs> thinking yourself, thinking, I'm getting paid for this. This is <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, equally, those experiences are so, again, that word humbling, but because of what they do is on the knife edge of of either trauma or success they land the trick and it all goes well they meddle yeah. they don't land the trick and they they fracture something and they get a concussion and people have died doing this stuff as you know so, yeah absolutely yeah it's really rewarding to see them come down into the, the day after putting a tough session in but some phenomenal people as well yeah. yeah i love it number three talk to me about what it's like working in the epl exciting challenging politics are rife wow, uh, i can imagine be it player politics or, or, or coaching politics I think when I when I was definitely working at first team level, you 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 live almost for you put the graft in during the week. Everyone's thinking the same way. It's about the weekend, and and your the fruition of what you do. You you kind of see that as a product come out of the weekend, and then being at the grass level with a with a group, you know, sort of feeling the atmosphere and the, the energy from from the ground around you, with all the fans in it is phenomenal. There's there's nothing like it. Yeah, but the politics are, are certainly a downside and if most of the minutes of the week are spent with politics it, it can get very challenging but again with some i think in certain clubs they do it really really well i think they've got great job thinking great people and great practice happening so that's really rewarding if you get a good fit i love it last but not least number four what's next for john noonan what are you working on what are you excited about anything yeah yeah so um well listen it was, it was only a year ago that i i decided to set up my own business noonanperformance.com where I'll, I'll consult with with athletes uh serious individuals corporate clients and then the coach mentorship and and, I, and i'm really still kind of feeling that out in terms of where we're taking the future so i'm enjoying the roller coaster of, of entrepreneurship and, yeah. and owning a business which is teaching me a lot of a lot of healthy lessons along the way and so really it, it's going to be about moving that from a period of of introduction to growth and, and hopefully maturity and get out of, uh, of what's in front of us right now with, with this horrible virus is yes. the most important. I love it. I love it, man. Well, John, 
You've been amazing to talk to today. Really appreciate your time. Where can my listeners find out more about you and what you have going on? Thank you, mate. Really, really appreciate that. So more than happy if people want to reach out over email, you can you can get me at, uh, which is john at noonanperformance.com. Alternatively, Instagram, Twitter is probably where you'll see me most with john underscore m for mother underscore noonan. It's quite a mouthful. I need to change that if I can. But yeah, that, that's, that's what you'll get me on those two channels. Awesome. Awesome. Well, John, thanks again, man. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, great to chat. Thanks, Mike. Thanks very much. All right, my friend, that does it for this week's show with John. Sincerely hope you enjoyed it. I love talking with people like him because there's just so much to be gained when you listen to somebody that's been successful across multiple sports. And obviously, he's been successful in soccer, in racing, in rugby. But when somebody's been successful across multiple sports, that's somebody that's really got something working for him, whether it's their philosophy, whether it's their personality, some combination of multiple factors. There is a reason that they've been successful, not just in one sport, but in multiple. And there's a lot of of knowledge to be gleaned from people like John. So I appreciate his time and him coming on. Now, small favor to ask, maybe two. Number one, if you are not already subscribed to the show, what are you doing, my friend? You got nothing else to do. You're locked up in quarantine. Might as well get smarter each and every week. So take 10 seconds out of your day, subscribe to the show, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play. We're pretty much everywhere. So if you're not already subscribed, do that now. If you are subscribed, thank you. I appreciate it. Now, do me one more favor. Go to the iTunes store. Give me a rating. Give me a review. Ratings and reviews make a massive impact on how many people see the show and how many people are exposed to the show. So if you would take two minutes out of your day and do that for me, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. So my friend, as always, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.